Thank you. We're, uh, we're going to switch gears here in more than one way <laughs> because I'm a clinician and for the last day and a half you've been hearing from some of the best researchers that I know and most of you probably have known, read of. Um, but we're going to switch gears here. I'm um, going to talk a little bit about a lot of my experiences as a clinician. I've been a drug and alcohol counselor for over 30 years, and I've been actually at Rutgers for 27 of those years, uh, working with college students. Um, my family always tells me uh, not to tell jokes, and so I'm not going to tell you a joke. However, I am going to tell you a little bit of a story because stories are right up my alley since I hear them all the time. Um, how many of you remember the movie Groundhog Day? Krista and Scott actually didn't realize last night I was practicing on them. <laughs> um, but uh, in the movie Groundhog Day, which is not a great movie, I have to admit, but it is an interesting movie because when you you know, the idea here is I wake up every morning and many of us wake up every morning and we go to work on a college campus and we deal with alcohol and drug problems. And eventually, we're going to get it right. <laughs> and through the hard work of a lot of the people here and a lot of the people in, your, in our audience, I think we will get it right. I think we're certainly getting better at this. Um, I am per a person who has a lot of experience dealing with addiction, um, and that perspective has actually really helped me in looking at the many, many types of drinking and drug use we see on our campuses. Um, I'm also a person who's very committed to having a comprehensive model on a campus, which we have all been hearing about, too. Um, there is no one size fits all. Um, it aggravates me to no end when, uh, you know, someone from, you know, a fraternity or a sorority or a residence hall will call me up and say, oh, you know, well, could you send over one of your recovering college students to do a program for us? And I'm like, <laughs> What is that going to do, guys, you know, uh, you know, is what's going on in my head. Um, but I realize the, uh, and how engaging it is and how compelling our students in recovery are. I mean, look at all the TV shows there are. Um, we all love a recovery story. And I actually really love recovery stories. So, uh, but we still need to keep in mind that not everybody is an ad has an addiction. And a number of the slides like yesterday indicated that it's somewhere in that 5 to 8 or 9%. Um, and, and by the way, those rates often don't include drug dependence. So I think we can add probably a few more people if we included that. Um, but we still have a lot of students who do not meet criteria for dependence. And we need to include environmental supports to help our low-risk students, because they do complain that there aren't enough things for them to do on campus, that everything in our cultures are about drinking. And part of my role on the um, Alcohol Implementation Committee is to keep working on developing more activities on our campus for low-risk students. Um, we also need to have policies for referral. We have uh, mandated students. Those mandated students come because we have policies that send them to my program for our basics uh, program. Um, and training frontline staff also to identify students at risk. Um, screening and brief interventions. Um, it is my dream to have every health center clinician and every mental health clinician do alcohol and drug screenings. I would love to see that happen on our campus. Um, we are not there yet. <laughs> um, uh, brief interventions we do, um, and uh, Helene has been a really important part in evaluating our brief intervention model, which is, by the way, wonderful for clinicians. I, I don't know how many of you our clinicians, but to know that what you do has an impact is one of the best feelings. <laughs> because so much of what we do, we never know that, never learn that. Um, and then we need to have people who are trained in alcohol and drug counseling 
to do short-term counseling because some of our brief interventions are going to produce students who need more help. And we have to be there and we have to be ready to offer those people some counseling. A lot of the work we do is harm reduction in nature. We do as many, we do as much work with students who need to reduce their use as we do students who need to be abstinent. In fact, the abstinent students are really a pretty small percentage. Again, my experience with addiction is also an, a good way to look at students who are coming in with lots of alcohol and drug problems, but are really not showing the criteria for dependence. So coming at it from the back, which is what I sometimes think of, is another way to identify students who really need to make some changes and hopefully engage them because part of the process is engaging someone. I, after I explain about confidentiality, the next thing out of my mouth is that we are a partnership. <laughs> um, I cannot do anything with you unless we're together on this process. And it is so important that I say that right up front because I almost always the reaction I get is almost always that sigh of relief. Oh, she's not going to tell me to stop drinking. Oh, she's not going to tell me to stop using drugs. We are going to be partners in this. And so you have to be honest with me is what I say, and I have to be honest with you. And from there, we move to the next step. So some of the students need more treatment than we can offer. Um, obviously, intensive outpatient program is a less intrusive alternative. It means that someone can continue to go to class and be enrolled and get treatment. Sometimes that's not going to work. We often will work with academic deans to reduce the number of courses someone's taking. Understand that these are never timed at the beginning of the semester. People don't time their recovery by a semester so that it's mid-semester and I can predict that any mid-semester I'm going to get people in panic. I haven't been to a class in four weeks. <laughs> That's the usual panic. And, um, and so we try. We do damage control. You know, well, what classes are you doing well and what classes are you not doing well in? Um, but sometimes we end up having to send someone to inpatient treatment. And we use medical leaves for that, by the way. OK. Now, what happens to those students who come back to campus? I get calls from professionals at other schools. Um, we send students away to rehab and they want to come back to college, but we have nothing to s help them on our campuses. And that's where this talk is actually going to begin. <laughs> um, campus recovery programs. The common characteristics, and there aren't many of us who have these programs, but I'll get to that. Uh, the common characteristics are that we um, have, there is an identified campus professional who is responsible for developing a support network for students in recovery. There is outreach and publicity about the program. It is not a secret. Okay? Part of the problem with addiction is the stigma associated with addiction. So that if we're going to have a program on our campuses, it can't be a secret. It has to be, we are doing this and it is a good thing. On the way over here this morning, we were talking about how um, uh, when we first started our recovery house, one of the you know, main problems we had that was addressed was, uh, well, if we start this recovery house at Rutgers, does that mean that we have a really bad problem here? And you know, my, my response, I became a spin doctor that day was actually um, everybody has these problems and everybody has students in recovery. Um, we're doing something about it. That's the positive part. Okay, so we need to have uh, an open, uh, openness about what we're doing. And we need to have facilities dedicated to a recovery program. Uh, it doesn't need to be a residence hall. It needs to have, be an office, though, where students can go. Um, the unique characteristics of programs are that recovery housing is something that's offered on some campuses or not. Sometimes it's on campus and sometimes it's off campus. Um, that there are 
on campus 12 step meetings is another variation. Sometimes the meetings are off campus, sometimes they're on campus. Um, academic credit given for courses required of students in recovery, that is one model. It doesn't work at all of our schools, it works at some of our schools. Uh, length of time in, in recovery prior to admission. The range is generally a minimum of three months, a maximum of a year. Again, it's a, a program variation. Um, I have been on the shorter end of the range because, again, we do a lot of work on our campus to engage students who start their recovery on our school, and it's very hard to tell someone who's two months in recovery that you have to wait <laughs> to move out of your residence hall and into the recovery house. So that's always been something of a, of a conflict. Um, funding sources and oversight of the program. Funding sources are a very serious problem for most recovery campus programs. Um, where do you get your funding from? There aren't many grants available that help us with the work. Uh, one of the problems I'll get to in a minute. Um, so, the need for these programs. Um, in the decade between 1992 and 2002, the numbers of admissions to adolescent treatment programs increased by 65% from 95,000 to 165,000 in the U.S. according to SAMHSA data. Increases like that are going to produce increases in young adults who are in recovery who want to go to college. It's not, not complicated. Um, actually, what's really interesting is anecdotally, um, our recovery program used to have a lot of students who were either transfer students or students who got sober while they were in college. In the last few years, we've had more students coming to our program who are traditional first-year students. That means they got into recovery before they came to college. So every year for the last four or five years, we've had at least a couple of freshmen, first year students, who came already in recovery to college. And I think that's going to be a trend that we're going to see. Um, two studies have reported that between 13 and 32 percent of college students meet DSM criteria for alcohol abuse, six to eight percent for alcohol dependence. We've been hearing that. In 2008 to 2009, that translated into about a million college students with alcohol dependence. Um, I don't want to exaggerate these numbers, but I also want to say that there's a good number of our students who really need support services on our campuses. Um, now, the good news is that when you provide recovery support to young people in college, you not only increase the opportunities to have a productive adult life, but it also contributes to recovery success. What are the campus challenges? Well, you know, we've been talking for um, a lot about how our campuses have, um, we have lots of students who are abusing alcohol, even occasionally to excessively. Um, we now have a group of students in recovery who are learning how to manage abstinence in the midst of all these other students who are doing some of their best experimentation. <laughs> so um, that creates tremendous problems. Um, maintaining abstinence is often dependent on restructuring daily lives to avoid behaviors and social triggers that lead to use, uh, of relapse. Um, so we're really trying to deal with some very extremes in our culture. And I think college campuses are extremes, by the way, have a lot of extremes. Some of our students, with a lot of humor, will say, um, they're doing things I did when I was 15. <laughs> um, you know, why should I have to put up with this? Uh, so that's their been there, done that attitude. Um, uh, there's a serious lack of privacy and space in most residential college living environments. I don't know the last time you've been in a dorm, but you know, you have a small little room, you have all your stuff in that room, your bathroom's down the hall, and you're right across the hall and next door to, you know, lots of other people. You have no space, no private space. 
Uh, so if your friends are all getting ready and getting dressed to go out drinking and they're pre-gaming, you're right there in the middle of it. It's not like you can go to another room and close the door. Not that that helps a whole lot. but um, And people in recovery need to fit in, uh, especially young people, uh, need to make new friends and need to have a sense of belonging. Um, and we have, they are still very young. They need to, they sometimes feel like they're missing out on the college experience. Um, and recovery communities provide social support for those students in recovery. We don't have a lot of research on the effectiveness of these programs. Uh, in the last, probably 2007, maybe the first study that's been done, Texas Tech, uh, is probably the school that has done and been able to do the most research in this area. Um, Augsburg College in Minnesota, small uh, private college in Minneapolis, has one of the largest recovery programs. Uh, to, uh, campus of perhaps 2,000 students has over 100 students in recovery on their campus. Um, so one of the ways that we track effectiveness at this very early stage is looking at relapse rates, um, GPA, and um, those are the and and um, those are the primary ways of of looking at success. Um, we've got a growing number of campuses. These are programs that just crop up from within a university. Uh, because there's somebody at a campus who um, feels the need to do this or has an interest in it or is in recovery themselves sometimes. So one of the oldest programs is at Brown University. And uh, we, we've done a little bit of history, uh, those of us who work in this area, and uh, we can't find any other program that's earlier than Brown. Uh, which was started in 1977 by uh, a former classics professor whose name is Bruce Donovan, who is uh, since retired and now has a predecessor, or whatever you call person after you. Um, and she um, is in an endowed position at the university. And her goal is to work with students who are in recovery. No house, just peer support network very effective. Um, other campuses that have followed, Rutgers was the second that I could find, um, but there are others that have come up. We have gone from three schools in 2002 to about 13 in, two, in 2010. It's very new, very new what we do. Um, so there's a wide range, you know, community colleges, UT Austin, UPenn, Georgia Southern, Rutgers Newark, um, lots of different uh, programs. The expression we use in our recovery schools meeting is if you build it, they will come, which is you know, the field of dreams expression. Um, I just wanted to show you a little bit about some of the, what these students have been through because these are not people with addictions who are in early stages. So this is a, these are a list of some of the uh, um, consequences or symptoms that some of the students at, through the Texas Tech research have encountered, obviously severe consequences uh, for a young group. Um, okay. um, this is some of the work that Augsburg has collected over 12 years. Their relapse rates are phenomenal given the population we are working with to see relapse rates of, um, you know, 6%, 10%. I mean, when you work with adolescents and young adults with addictions, this is pretty remarkable. Um, I'm not going to make believe that this isn't a, a subset. I mean, these are people, again, who've gotten into college, who've gone through treatment, who've, um, uh, you know, maintained abstinence, so we're not talking about people fresh out of rehab. Uh, so giving it a good perspective here. Um, so how does one initiate uh, creating a campus recovery program? I explained a little bit about the fact that it comes from different people and places, academic departments versus student services, 
there's no rhythm to, or rhyme to the way that, oh, five minutes. <laughs> OK, so uh, I'm going to skip a little bit here through. These are some of the admission criteria. You'll have access to this. Uh, managing relapse is something we talk about in very upfront terms right from the beginning because students need to know what the rules are. They need to know what the expectations are. Um, the Rutgers Recovery House started in 1988. Um, it was very much a conversation I was having with students in recovery about where, what, we, what they needed and housing became a constant theme about living with people who are either using or not having uh, friends who are in recovery. And so with the students, we started this process. The first thing the students said to me when I said, well, what about a recovery residence hall? Was like, they looked at me with horror and they said, no signs. <laughs> on the building. We don't want to be the drunk floor. We don't want to be, you know, we don't want to be singled out. So I said, okay. So even to this day, we have a nice brochure. It says recovery housing, has all the stuff about recovering housing, no picture, no address. Okay? And Rutgers is big enough that we could probably get away with that. A small school may not be able to get away with that, but we can. Um, so uh, it's not a halfway house, it's a residence hall on a college campus, which is why we have to be fairly selective about who we choose to live in the recovery house. Um, the emphasis in the recovery house is on self-governance and accountability. We don't do drug testing. Most people are pretty shocked that I don't do drug testing. We do drug testing when we have suspicion, but not routinely. Uh, the best predictor of whether you're about to relapse is your behavior. So if you're living with a bunch of people and they're like, get, you know, together a lot of the time, doing things, if, if your behavior starts to go off the deep end, your friends are gonna really know that. And so that's what we really rely on. We've had our recovery program at Rutgers for 27 years. It started with four students in recovery. Um, we have hundreds of alumni at this point. Um, we've had recovery reunions at 10 years, 15 years, at 10 years, 20 years, and we had our 25th reunion. About 125 people come to each of our reunions. Um, we have people now in their 30 to 50 range who have 25 years of recovery, which means they have spent their entire adult life in recovery which is exactly what my dream has been. Um, we had uh, children at our second reunion, um, and we have lots of, lots of success stories. Um, Monday night, oh, these are some of the enhancements that we've been able to get through a grant we got from the state of New Jersey. Um, again, uh, the only thing I want to highlight here is I miss the recovery graduation on Monday night. Um, which was very, very hard. <laughs> um, and uh, we had uh, nine graduates this year. Um, we have 22 in the recovery house, by the way, co-ed recovery house. Um, one of the uh, people who graduated on Monday um, is one of those dramatic stories. Uh, she graduated Phi Beta Kappa. Four years ago, she was living in the streets as a heroin addict. That's a pretty dramatic story. And I, and I am not going to say that because uh, that's just an exception. That's actually something that I hear on a regular basis. A lot of our students are remarkable. They're high functioning, high achieving. Um, and, uh, and we have given them an opportunity to turn their life around by offering them the kind of support that we offer. Um, and just to close, um, just wanted to talk a little bit about AA. Do I have time? Okay. Um, one of the most misunderstood, underutilized support networks is free, available at nights and on the weekends when I am not. <laughs> um, by the way, all the things I have just described to you are very time consuming. I spend 25 to 30 hours a week in counseling sessions with clients. I also
do research sometimes. I also do prevention work uh, with high-risk students. I am on the alcohol committee. I do a lot of different things. This is exhausting work. But um, on good days, my uh, colleagues uh, tell me that they love the passion that I have for my work. On bad days, they describe passion in negative terms. <laughs> so if those of you have any doubt, passion has two sides. <laughs> I can drive people crazy, I'm sure. Um, but AA is something that I think is very misunderstood. It's a wonderful peer support network. I have students who, from all backgrounds, cultures, religions who embrace and can get better through 12-step programs. We have on-campus meetings. We have young people's meetings. Um, we just need to be able to help them in understand and utilize these support networks in addition to all the other works that, work that we do with them. Universality, support, and installation of hope are some of the most important things that we can uh, give to our young people, and 12-step programs do them remarkably well. Um, ARS is the Association of Recovery Schools, very small organization. We have an annual meeting. It's going to be in Boston this year at Northeastern, um, and uh, this information will be on the web. And I want to thank, again, uh, some of the people who have been instrumental in my work in my life. Um, and uh, thank you all for listening today. <laughs>